Uh, welcome everybody. We're here to talk about Figma, Drupal, and design systems, three of my favorite things. Um, a little about me to get things started. Uh, my background is I'm a graphic designer by trade, but I also love technology and I love organizing information and showing people how to use things, teaching, sharing. So Figma, Drupal, and design systems go really well together for me. I like all of those things equally. Um, I also spend a lot of time thinking these days about accessibility, which is another dimension to all of those things. The way people use technology, the way they uh, think through and find information, uh, presentations of information, it's a whole other dimension to what, what I do. So very much a, a jack of all trades, user experience, design, and technology. Um, so today's, today's presentation, uh, I really want it to feel like a practical case study in something that, we, a project we just finished recently that involved creating a pretty complex design system for one of our clients, Temple University. Um, so there's gonna be three parts to, to today. I'm gonna to try to cover the background and the challenge and kind of how we got started on the problem. Then I'm gonna do a demo for about 15 or 20 minutes showing how efficiently you can make pages using the design system. So what the end user of the system will experience when they're creating with it. And then with the remaining time, we could dive into kind of under the hood and some of the things that we did uh, when setting up the system in Figma and some of the challenges we encountered and how we decided to organize it. So that's, that's what today is. Just a quick note about iFactory. We serve almost exclusively higher education. We love higher ed, we love colleges, universities, learning, students, uh, you know, engagement, all of that stuff. We do everything from discovery and strategy to brand to user experience design, writing, SEO analytics, development, all of that stuff. So we have uh, a full team that thinks about all dimensions of creating, thinking through, discovering, creating, and rolling out websites for higher ed. Okay, so let's dig into part one, which is the background. So Temple University, uh, one of our clients, um, largest university in Philadelphia, 40,000 undergraduate and graduate uh, and professional students, 500 academic programs, 17 schools and colleges, and all of that really results in many websites that they have to manage, right, under a single brand. They have a Drupal framework. They, it's been in existence since Drupal 7. We've worked with it over a few years on different projects. Uh, it has a standard set of components updated and they've been expanded over time. Um, they're, they're using it on lots of websites, large and small, everything from like their main college websites under Temple to small center or initiative or department sites. So already in use, already been kind of battle tested and refined. It's got a default design style to it. So some, at some point in the past, they created a house style that looks like Temple that has their color palette, fonts, everything. They created all these um, components and it's thoroughly documented. So uh, this is a sandbox website that, we've, that we used actually when creating the design system to test all the components and see how they work in real, in real life. So it's a, just a sort of dummy homepage with lots of things, everything from like a, a big hero uh, type component, which they call the billboard, uh, to you know, headings and text styles and carousels of profiles of people, um, you know, calls to action, different button styles, tables, quotes, uh, you know, link lists, tabs, media galleries, um, news and events, video events, you know, all sorts of stuff. You can see all the different things that they already have that they're using on their websites. So we used this sandbox site to kind of just explore all the possibilities that exist on the current, in the current framework. They have very thorough documentation on it. Uh, a very elaborate Google Doc that goes into each component and all of the different fields that come with that component, which ones are required, what their type is, 
you know, notes for using it, and then screenshots of the actual you know, admin interface and how you would choose different display options, um, you know, color palettes that you can choose sometimes for some of the components, and then finally, like what it looks like you know, on the front end. So very mature, very wide, you know, already very widely used design system. And um, the problem that we were, the reason why they needed help creating an actual design system, because they already have it, is that when they're creating new sites, right, uh, planning them out, uh, there's a few things that they're doing. There's, there's things like meeting with stakeholders, you know, to talk about what their new, what, whether they want to be on the framework or want to do their own custom thing. Uh, what are the requirements? Then they they're, they're sharing written documents with those stakeholders and those teams. Like, here's some of the things we want on the website, and um, you know, really the expectations around what they need. Then they're also uh, when laying out these new sites, they're using they were using design files that were either copies of old files that were used for prior projects or just designing from scratch with a blank document. Um, and then developing the new site off of those designs. And you know the problem with some of that is that there's some inefficiencies in that process. There's accidents that can happen, deviations from the accepted way that components should be used, miscommunications around what's possible. Um, so some of those problems they wanted to be able to solve and what we, we, we decided the goal was was a centralized toolkit in the form of a design library that they could use when making uh, new websites. So it would have a centralized repository of all the canonical design elements from type styles and color styles to everything from you know buttons to icons to the, those full-blown components that we scrolled through a minute ago. All of those documented in design language for people who can use the library to make designs, make it shareable, make make it updatable so that they can push out updates to file, design files that are in, in existence and come automatically with guardrails for use so you're not accidentally doing things the wrong way. And so, you know, the benefits in the end that we, we saw with a design library is that somebody could quickly lay out pages and experiment with content before actually touching any code without, you know, setting up a dev site uh, not having to imagine through a written document. You could actually mock up a page exactly as it will look, experiment with the, the text, the images, the order uh, in, in design software, and show that to stakeholders, make it as real looking as possible, and then also ease the path to development. So these files would use the library with the, the canonical components and styles, and then those get handed off to the development team and they know exactly which parts to use that they've already created in Drupal. So that, that was the goal and the benefits that we saw. And so the two steps in that process of planning new sites that we aim to simplify are the design step and then the development step. So you might be thinking that this is sort of like working backwards from the way design systems are typically thought about and planned and created. Oftentimes, it's, it, there's an initiative that we're going to create a design system, you know, as part of our, our an update to our product or our, our web universe, and we're going to design, plan it, organize it, and then design it, and then recreate, make those components in code. Or the development is moving along in parallel with the design, you know, doing some under the hood back end work and architecting it in Drupal while the designers are creating the styles and then those come together. We were kind of working backwards in this case. We were mirroring or recreating the live components that they have on their websites in design software so that we could, again, use that to make, make prototypes and mockups to experiment with content. So what we had to do was we had to examine that sandbox site, every component at small, medium, and large, make sure we were accounting for responsiveness. We had to examine every display property that was possible, you know, aligning left, center, right, of, you know, stacked, grid, carousel, all these, all the display options had to be accounted for in the design system. And it also account for flexible content. So it's not just this one piece with this many words, it might be twice as long, you could have things side by side, 
you know, how do you deal with things that are uneven? So all of that we had to think about when creating this design library. So the tool that we used was Figma, very popular app for UX, UI design these days. Um, some of the benefits, the things I like about it are that it's cloud-based. You know, like we're going to use Figma in the demo. It's right here in my web browser. I don't need to install anything. If anyone can go in. You could have other non-designers come into Figma in their web browser and look at the designs in development. And it's collaborative. It can, people can make comments. They can uh, you know, create ideas and collaborate. Uh, it's very much easy to use, easy to learn as well if you've used any other design software like any of the Adobe products or Sketch. It's an easy transition I found to Figma. The UI is very similar. The concepts are very similar about how you organize layers and the inspector with properties and then this idea of components which are like symbols in Sketch and you know where it's a reusable element that you can Know, tied together into one global instance that you control all the, insta all the instances of. So it's great for creating complex design systems. That's the, the big benefit of it. So it's kind of got two, two types of features. One is a traditional drawing tool, like an open-ended canvas where you can be creative, you can drag things around, you can, uh, you're not limited in any kind of way, like a surface that you can just be creative on. Uh, like you would expect in a traditional piece of design software, but then it also has some features, one of which is called Auto Layout, that uh, allows you to create guardrails or guidelines for uh, interacting with elements on a page and allowing them to respond to one another. So follow a grid or you know, fluidly resize as the page is bigger or smaller. Push down other content as you lengthen the content in one element, it pushes everything else down, which is kind of like real web pages. So that's that's one thing that's great about Figma is you can set up those properties and rules that start to mimic what a real web page does. There are differences between CSS and Figma. The auto layout feature is like a subset of Flexbox and CSS, if you, think of, if you know what that is. Flexbox is used in CSS to lay out rows and columns of, of content. There's some things Figma can do that are just like that. There are other things it can't do. We ran into some of those as we were trying to perfectly replicate uh, a flexible set of components. But there's enough about it that allows it to be a, a realistic, usable uh, tool to, to demo like an actual website in design software. So um, we used a, uh, a design system as our method, and that you know that's sort of a a field of thinking around how you create design systems. There's a few things that we are fans of that we used. Atomic design is a philosophy that comes into play with design systems, which is really at its simplest, collecting all the interface elements that you have or that you might need, organizing them simple to complex, and combining them in different ways that are flexible. So for example, we have an icon set, right? A set of symbols that are UI icons in the design system. And then those UI icons can be used inside a button in addition to text to indicate different kinds of links, like an internal link, an external link, or a download link. And then buttons are used inside of a component at the bottom, which is called the embassy component, which is pretty simple, but it's a heading, some intro text, and then up to three links. So you can see how there's this like nesting effect of simplifying the basic ingredients and then allowing those to be used throughout the system in various components. And really the, the overall uh, effect of this is that in the end, elements fit together in various combinations. It's really not about specific page designs. It's about a large collection of parts that can be used to create pages depending on the need. Okay, so that, that's kind of the ultimate purpose, is that it's extremely flexible. We don't have to anticipate every kind of page that might be needed. We create a set of parts that address certain kinds of messaging or content, and then those can be used in any order on whatever pages they're needed. Okay, so part two, we're gonna do a little demo here. So, um, what I wanted to do was create a homepage for a fictional center at Temple. 
so uh, it's called the Center for Design Systems. And thanks to a little help from my friend ChatGPT, I created a document of sample content for this fictional center. Uh, so, you know, let's say this is a document that our stakeholder has sent over saying, hey, design system team, we need a new site for the center. We want to use the framework in Drupal. Here's some content we definitely want on the website. Go ahead and make something and then let's review it. So this document has, you know, it looks like it has a tagline, a mission statement, some about us text. And then we have four initiatives, areas of priority that they worked on, with a little blurb about each one. There's some important statistics, right? The year they were founded, number of students, uh, research projects. Then we have some uh, names and bios of their leadership team here. Uh, find, uh, there's a testimonial there by somebody that benefited from their work. Uh, we got some news and events with dates and times, and then some actions, right? Mean things that they want people to do on their website, you know, calls to action. Uh, and then finally, a list of pages that they think they might, might want in their sitemap and their menu. So this gives us some nice raw material to do a demo. And so I'm in Figma right now. I've got a kind of starter page created that's really just blank except for a header and then down here a footer. So it's got those two components all ready to go, but then the rest of the page is blank. And so we're just going to make a home page and show how how you can use the design library using this uh, using the design system. So first of all, we've got the header here. Um, it seems like the first thing I would want to do is take the Center for Design Systems, put that up in the college name, where the college name goes. So we've got that. And then I remember down below we had some pages they wanted to include. So, you know, About Us feels like it should be in the main menu. So I can just paste in About Us. Looks like there's some sub-navigation here under About Us they're suggesting um, for four separate links. And so if I actually go in and over here on the right side, uh, apologies if that's too small to read. I'll try to elaborate on what, what's showing. These are the properties of the header component that are available for use. So notice there's lots of little drop downs and switches I can, I can uh, tap. This is to change aspects of the header within the boundaries of the design system. So first of all, under the first, uh, there's a header menu item. I can switch this from default to click, and I get like a drop down menu with the sub menu for About Us. And so here I can actually enter the, sorry, my typing is terrible. Um, So I see that they wanted history, mission, DEI, and strategic plan. So let's just populate that. I'm just pressing the tab key to kind of go down the list. And then, okay, and then this last one, I'm just gonna hide it because we don't need that. It shortens the menu automatically. Cool, so I can go back here and now change this back to default. Now for the other menu items, we've got people, academic programs, fellowships, and events. Maybe these, these four belong in the main menu. And events. Then back here, these other four feel like kind of secondary, so let's put those in the secondary navigation. So it's up here. Directory and news. So I've got I've got a header created. Um, that was easy. So let's move down the page and think about what we should put next. Probably some kind of dramatic hero image. Maybe that billboard component that we saw on the sandbox site would be good to do next. Notice they have a tagline here, so maybe that goes into the, the billboard. So if I go to the Assets tab in Figma, I get access to the full design library and all of the components that are available. So over on the, the left side here, it says component colon with the name of all the components. There's an accordion, there's audio, banner, there's billboard right there. I can just open that up and I see a little thumbnail of it, and I can just drag it over here into the masthead region. 
And uh, what it drops down onto the page is like a is a baseline version of that component with as much suggestion of what you should put in there as possible. That's one of the decisions we made. So all the text fields always begin with what should what kind of content goes in that field. So over here it says title. Then you can see it says blurb, or ipsum, whatever. So it starts with blurb. That's what it's called in the documentation for the billboard. There's a title field, there's a blurb field. So we're mirroring what the Drupal documentation says these fields are so that somebody using it that knows the system can say, oh, I know, now I can put it in there. So let's, let's put their tagline here. Um, let's make up a compelling headline. Organizing the world's interfaces. Let's maybe we'll link to a page that will suggest it's a vision page for them. So let's put that in that button. This one. Oops. This one I'm actually just going to hide. You don't need the second call to action. Um, I don't really want these four CTA cards across the bottom. I think I'm going to do that a different way. So I'm going to turn off the CTA grid switch over on the right here. Just turn that off. Those are gone. The, the, sh the height is shortened up. So the background image, notice how it says three colon one. For every image in the components, we put the suggested aspect ratio for the image into it. So when you see it, you know what kind of image to crop, what, what the ratio should be. So I can come over here and, and choose image. I've got a bunch of sample images here, uh, some three to one. So let me find a good one for the top of my home page. I like this one. It's environmental. Text will work good over it. Hit, hit enter, and it's now in there. There's a dimming layer that already is over the image to ensure adequate contrast that's built into the component. So we don't have to worry about what does it look like? Am I getting it right? I just supply the image, full color, not dimmed, and the component handles the rest. So underneath the hero, um, let's see, what should we put in next? How about those statistics? So uh, what would be a good component for some stats? Uh, so th there's something called the CTA component that's like cards that can have big text or numbers with a link. So I think I'm going to use this three across carousel here. I'm just going to drag that in. So this component comes with an introduction. I'm not going to use it, so I'll turn that switch off. So no introduction. And now I've got three stats. I'm only going to show three. I don't think I want these to be a carousel because it's too much to expect somebody to go through numbers more than three, so I can turn the arrow off. So I can make this a left arrow or a right arrow, or both. I, can, I can simulate where it is in the carousel, but I don't want the carousel, I'm gonna turn the arrow off. So back here, I'm gonna go back to my statistics. I think I wanna do, um, let's see, 2013 was the year of founding. Uh, let's see, number of students enrolled might be a good one. So let's see, 132 students enrolled. Maybe research projects is a good thing to show on the home page. So it was 43. So I've got three across statistics, and I can actually change other things about these cards. Like for each one of them, it comes with its own properties, one of which is color scheme. So they do something that they call tricolor where you can make a three color a three color sequence like this. I actually don't want to do that. It's, it's not enough of temple cherry red. So I'm going to leave it. Um, I'm going to actually do the alternating brand colors, which means that the second one should be charcoal. So it goes from cherry, charcoal, cherry, charcoal. So this is an approved set way to display a CTA carousel with the brand colors. I know that from knowing the design system and which color schemes are the right ones to use. There's a part of this that's we're expecting users of this system to know the framework. So it, it, there's certain decisions you can make with these properties that can result in something looking broken or not uh, acceptable. There's certain aspects of it that we left open-ended where a designer has to know like this color combination is not acceptable, this one is. So that's just a little note in how we kind of trade-off we, we struck with that. So I've got three a three across um, statistics. I think their mission really should be on the home page too. I maybe should put that first. So 
let's go back up here and let's go to just a body text field. Let's drag that in. Um, so their mission here at the top was this. First of all, I want it to be centered, so I'm going to center the text. Then I'm going to type our mission above it, select that, and I'm going to change the text style from body to be an H2. So I can see all of my text styles are here with the right font family, font size, weight, all of that. I just click H2 and it makes it the size that it should be. Then I'm going to select all this body text, the sample body text, and paste the mission in. So I've got a mission here. I actually think that should go above the numbers because it kind of needs some breathing room between the, the hero and the next thing. So um, one thing I can do is, uh, is I can press the arrow key to just move it up a slot, right? So do I want it below? Do I want it above? All I'm doing is moving it up and down with the arrow keys. This template, the starter page template, comes with uh, the right amount of spacing between components built in. It's right on the, it's part of auto layout, the container that all these components are in. It says there's going to be you know, 40 pixels between components. I don't have to worry about repositioning anything or, or being like, how far away should it, is it supposed to be? I can just put the components in I want and change the order and all the spacing and the sizing are handled by the system. So we've got a mission statement, some stats. I think next I want to add uh, that testimonial. So let's see. Got my quote here. So uh, the sorry. So we've got a block for testimonials, which is a quote block. So I'm going to drag a carousel in here. So I've got. Uh, a field for the quote itself, and then I can see I've got a name and a job title here that I can paste in. So I've got name and professional title, somebody that really benefited from the work of this center. I've got an image here that's got one colon one, so it's a square image. I know that's the size I need. I can come over here and change the image. Uh, it's Miriam, so I'm going to select her. She's right in there. Looks great. Um, now, one thing I just realized is, you know what? I think I want to put this quote next to something else in the two-column layout. I don't really want it centered. There's too much white space on the sides. So one thing that I can do is uh, use a layout component. So there's a component called layout with different column divisions, a one-third, two-third, two-thirds, one-third, and then 50-50. I'm just going to drag one of those 50-50s in and make that full width. And then um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move that quote block into one of the columns. So OK, so I've got, I've got a body text component I'm just going to delete. And then I'm going to go to this one, the quote block. And I'm going to. drag this in, hopefully. There it is. <laughs> so drag and drop, a little tricky. you got to get used to it. But I moved that into the left column. And now I can go to the right one. And I can actually just swap the component over on the right. So it's the body text component is what it comes with. I can just go back and I have the access to the same list of all those components that we see on the left side. So I can say, um, you know, it needs a photo. There's a lot of text-based components here. So let's go down and find an image component and drop that in. Um, I'm going to hide the caption. I don't really need it. That's a simple keystroke. And then I've got a 4 by 3 image here, which is suggested. Uh, I can actually, in that image component, I can actually, there's a drop down property here for any aspect ratio that exists in the system. So I can have a 4 by 3, a 3 by 4, a 16 by 9, and I can figure out what size feels appropriate. I'm going to stick with 4 by 3 and go in here, go back to my 4 by 3s, and 
put that one in, looks good. So I've got that. Now I want another two column layout below. So I'm gonna come back here to the layout. I'm gonna duplicate the layout. That's something we can do. I want another two column layout. And then I'm gonna go up to the quote block and I actually wanna choose something else. Something about, I think the about us text should be in there. So I'm gonna choose the CTA. I'm gonna choose the stack. So this gives me a stack of three cards. I wanna turn off the intro. And then I actually am just gonna hide two of the cards. I just want one of them. And that's perfectly uh, acceptable in the design system. Uh, one thing I want to do here is go get my content first. So about us, maybe just the first sentence of about us will be a good fit. So paste in that, call it about us. And then this component comes with some properties that I want to be able to use. So uh, one of them is to change the color scheme. I think I'll use the ochre. I also want to add a background image and make it half width. Because that if we have enough space for that, I think that'll look good. So it makes it narrows the content, it gives me a background image. I can now just go in and choose my 16 by 9 suggested image. So I think that one looks good. City of Philadelphia. So we've got uh, that one, and then on this other side, I think I want to list their initiatives. So I'm going to swap out the image component that we have there with something called a hyperlist. That gives me a list of five items with text and an icon. I'm going to, re I'm going to eliminate the, the intro text, but still leave the title. Call it initiatives, and then I'm going to come back here and look at their initiatives. So they have four initiatives. I'm just going to quickly paste those in. Research, education, partnerships. Last one, I'm just going to hide it. It shortens the, the length of that up, brings the bottom line up. And each one of these, I can actually choose the icon as well from a library of icons that are already in the system. So we just have a few sample ones here for now. They don't really match these concepts, but they're planning to build out templates, of dozens of icons from the same library that they're already using. So I can just swap the icons like this. I don't have to worry about pasting them in or resizing them. They just, they just work. So that's great. So we've got some initiatives. I think there's just two other things I want to add here, one of which is uh, profiles of their, of their faculty and executive team. So there's a profiles uh, component. I'm going to put in the three across. Oops. And drag that up here move it down using the arrow key. So we've got uh, something here that says our people. I'm going to remove the intro text. So I've got three plus a carousel if I want. I think for this home page uh, demo that I'm going to show them, I'm just going to put the first three people that are on their team in for demonstration purposes. So I can come here and paste Dr. Emily, who's the director. Professional title. And then I've got Sarah, the education coordinator. And then Jason Lee, who is the industry relations manager. And then these other text fields, I don't need those. I'm just going to hide them with a quick shortcut. Actually, just going to multi-select. Hide, the other stuff comes up. Now, to make these the same height, so they're not uh, staggered like this, I can just put a soft return into these two. And they're the same height. Now, I can do my images, just like I've done the other ones. I know these need to be square portraits. So coming back up here, I've got Emily's photo. Sarah's photo, and Jason's photo. 
So I've got a gallery of their leadership team. And then finally, I want to add some news. So they have a variety of options for news. I'm going to use another three across carousel. I'll call it latest news. The intro text, I don't want any, so I'll just eliminate that. And then um, they have some news stories down here with the heading and some dates. So the first one, put here. In the component, it, it shows the format that the date should take. So it's all caps, three letter month, two digit day, and then four digit year. So that format that's required or that should be used is, is evident when using the component itself. So I know that I need to do all caps July 3, 2023, so I can follow that standard. So I'm just going to put it, pop in the other two news items. September 12th. For some reason, the news items that spat out are in the future. So they're a very future focused center. So I'm not surprised. Except 12, 2023. And then finally, I think it was November 7th, 2023. And then my images. These are four by three, so I can come back here. Enter one. Two. Three. Okay, one last thing. There's this thing at the end, which is like the, the footer area where we can make a big statement and have people do something, our calls to action. There's something in the system called the CTA last call. That's like a big, splashy, big image. I actually am not going to use the, the button, so I'm just going to hide it. But this, I think, is a good place to say, join us. And then under actions, they have, they have submitted a statement about joining that they liked. So I'll just put that in. And then I'm just going to use these three buttons that come in the footer for their actions, which are give, uh, sign up or something and then apply for fellowship oh so um, this comes with I'm gonna get rid of that corner icon this comes with an image so I'll go back to my three by ones pick another one that I like this one feels pretty dramatic, showing every showing the community. So I'll just put that in again. It's in the background. It's dimmed. It looks great. So I'm going to ignore the footer because it's a little more time consuming. But we've got we've got a homepage here. We made it using standardized components, using acceptable ways of fitting them into a layout with acceptable colors, fonts, text fields. Um, I like how it looks, but what if the stakeholder says, and we want to see mobile too, everyone's on mobile. Does that mean I have to spend you know, a whole other bunch of time recreating this, selecting the components again, entering the content? Well, not really. So the way this works is I've got a mobile-sized page here as well. It's blank, just like it was before. So I'm going to take the header. I'm just going to paste the header in. So I just pasted my lock. Oops. Sorry. Delete. So I just pasted my wide header in, and it's not fitting. Obviously, there's a property over here, format, where I can just change it to be narrow. So it now just made it the mobile version, and it kept my content that I had entered. So the Center for Design Systems is in there. So I can do the same thing with this billboard. There's a masthead region ready to go. I can paste my billboard in. It's too wide, I can just select the narrow format and it formats the content to be for mobile. I can come down here to the, the body area and copy all of my components, come into the body area here, paste those in, 
and then go one by one and start the mission, the body text automatically fits once it's resized. This three across carousel of numbers. I can go, instead of the three slide version, I can do the one slide, which is made for narrow screens. So it'll show the first of those three cards with an arrow I can turn on for mobile that lets you paginate through a carousel and see the other ones. So my layout, I can just set it to be vertical, my two column layout. For the quote, I have another property, why it was supposed to narrow, makes it a little shorter. The image looks fine, that already resized on its own. You can stack this. Now this CTA, which is, looks a little too tall for mobile, uh, there's a property down here, I can just turn off the half width. So this is actually how it's supposed to work on mobile. Just the color overlay and the content goes all the way across. The background image is still there, it looks great. The hyper list looks fine already as it is. The people block, the profile block, I can actually go from three to one slide there as well. And same for news, I can go to one slide with a carousel arrow to see the other ones. And then down here under the anchor, I can click, select my last call component, paste that in, switch, switch to the narrow version. And finally, my footer, I can just paste the, fo the uh, footer in, delete the one that's there, and for the footer, select narrow, and all my calls to action are there. So in like a minute, two minutes, I just made a mobile version using the, the large version without having to recreate and re repaste all the content. It's formatted for the screen, it snaps to the right size. So that's, that's the experience we wanted people to have, is be able to, to do that. I could run this now as a prototype and um, demonstrate for a stakeholder, like the hover states are there already as part of the components. So I've got hover states working. So you know I could put this in a device frame, Figma lets you choose which iPhone you want this to show on if I wanted to, and I could actually say, here's, here's a, a suggested homepage using the framework, what do you think? use the commenting function in Figma to uh, let somebody make comments. So I've got comments here on the stakeholder. I could say hyperlist needs to be more visual for our initiatives. We want pictures there. So and I could consider that feedback and make that change. So that's the experience we wanted people to have. Um, just a few things with the three minutes we have left. Uh, this is the, the actual library. So this is in Figma, this is the canonical source copy of the library, and we, there's a few things we did to set it up so that it's user friendly. First of all, um, in Figma there's the library function, which is you say, make this file a shareable library. Right? This Figma file is the one that I want to be the library, and it pops open this window that, that shows you all of the, extracts all of the things that can be included in a library, text styles, color styles, and components, and I can selectively publish all of them or some of them. So uh, and if I make an update in this file, like a component has a new display option and I can make that, I can publish an update to that one component and then any file that's using it, like my homepage file I was just working on, will get a notification saying, updates are ready for review. And I can absorb that update or hold off on it. So that's the library function in Figma that we use. Another thing we wanted to do was make sure that any new person that was uh, coming onto Temple's team or who they were hiring as a third party contractor to use the library could get onboarded to how it's set up and how to use it and some of the decisions that were made. So this uh, first page in the library that we call Foundations. I could run this as a prototype, and it's essentially a slide deck, as a, an onboarding guide slide deck for somebody that's new to the library. So they can go through and say, introduction, here's the library, this is what it's for, here's a link to the Drupal 9 documentation, that's the source of record, the source of truth for these components. It talks about how the components were set up. So one of the things we decided to do is every one of these components has the component itself that you can use on a page, and then parts that make up that component. So for example, the uh, accordion component 
if I go down to that and take a look at it, the accordion component has the component itself that I can use on a page and then pieces that make up that. So the group of rows is a, is a subcomponent. Each individual row is a, is a subcomponent, a part that can have a open, closed hover. So we don't want people using those parts on a page accidentally on their own. So one thing we did in the organizing system is we named it with slash parts before the, the subcomponent name. And what that results in in Figma is when I'm here selecting a component, the accordion for example, I get the main component that I can use right away, I can see it, and then there's a subfolder that's the parts folder. So you, I would have to open that parts folder to use a part, which I shouldn't do. So it kind of sequesters the pieces of the system you shouldn't use by themselves and elevates the components that you should use. So that's one thing we did. So the onboarding guide kind of shows you how the properties and components are set up, and the breakpoints, et cetera. So um, that's what I've got. We're at 45 minutes. I'd love it if anybody had any questions. Uh, happy to answer. Yep. Um, so I'm curious about how you organized your uh, pages. Like, Yeah, so the, um, the way we usually do it is to have like a sheet like this that has large, medium, and small sizes for all the different type styles that are in the system. We start with headings, H1 through H6. Sometimes there's an alternate display, like H2 can be caps in some places, so we include that as well. It turned out Temple, their live design system, did not have much of a size change large, medium, and small. The only thing that goes down in size is the H1. All the others are same as large. Like, so they have a constant font size value regardless of your screen size. So we use this table just to illustrate that. Maybe in the future they'll make refinements and add more sizes. This is how they, you would discover what those are. As for actually which fields get a text size, we do headings, we do body text, body bold, body italic, links get their own. Um, there's a few others and not a lot. So what we discovered too in inspecting all these live components is that there's a lot of text fields that look like they're the same across, but there's subtle differences in the line height or the font size. And so our vision at the beginning was we're going to have a small but widely used set of core type styles for all text fields, and every text field would be tied to a type style. But we started to see, like, in this component, it's 14 pixels with 21 pixels of line height, and this other component, it's 15 pixel font size with 20, 20 pixels of line height. So while they visually look similar, it was like, we don't want to just make them the same because then it wouldn't match the live components. So we just, elect, we just selected a few things that we did see recurring that were the same value and included those in this list and not everything else. So, yeah. uh, it's just a comment. This is so impressive. Like, this takes so much work and it's so thought out. And when I thought you'd be done demo demoing how a certain component could work, there was like options. It's like, I'm just very. Oh, cool. Yes. Thank you. Appreciate it. I was wondering, like, how does this map to the you know, like, installation? So, how does this, like, once you build out your pages in Figma, like, how do you migrate that? Yeah, so the, the process is a little more standard there, which is that their framework team spins up a new site and then somebody enters the content by selecting the components. And the Drupal admin, which has its own list of here's all your components, they're named the same. And again, they have the same field field labels for all the text. So, but it, it, it isn't, there's no export or anything like that where you can move the content into Drupal. Yeah, it's a recreation. Do you know if they're using blocks and layout builder or something, something else? Can be they, um, they're not using Layout Builder, as far as I can tell. 
for my editing experience. It's, um, I'm not a Drupal expert, so I may get some of this terminology wrong, but the back end, when you assemble a page, you're essentially creating this stack of rectangles with the name of the component. You can open it. Yeah, yeah they're paragraphs. Yeah, they're paragraphs. Cool. So it's like filling out a form for each component. Oh, I do have a question kind of related to that. Do you ever have commu like communications teams then using this to like prep their content with pages? And that's what they want to do. Yeah, cool. that's why we, we did this all this work. Because yeah. they could just create a create a quick spin up a dev site and like put the blocks in there and enter the content there. But that's more time consuming and it requires somebody else to do some work. So they wanted, they, they had something before we started, which was in Sketch, and it was very incomplete, and it was outdated. So they said, let's create this tool, make it easy to understand, and then they just hired somebody within the last six months who's, who likes Figma and uses it a lot, who's going to start creating uh, pages like this to, to demonstrate what it can do for, for new sites that they have to launch. Yeah, so it's used, so not only like reaching consensus on how the site's generally going to look, but like a program gate, like getting the real content prep before the site is necessary. Right, exactly. Yeah. Instead of like a, a bunch of Google Docs with like, here's the text, and go to this library for some photos, like you'll be able to map it out and see like, is this, is this conveying the right message? Is it visual enough? Is it you know, the right order? Are the right links there? You can put it all together and have a look. exist in Drupal first and then you had to build them in Figma or do they exist in Figma first then you built them in Drupal or kind of at the same time? So it is, it is sort of that reverse process I was talking about. It was fully built in Drupal and documented okay. and everything and we were basically like dropping components into that sandbox site and, and inspecting them with the Chrome inspector to be like how thick is this border and what's the padding on that and then recreating that in Figma. If you had to do that again, would you do that the same way, build it in Drupal first or build it in Figma? If you were going from scratch? If I were if I were going from scratch, the ideal process is that there's a planning process where the designer and information architect and the lead developer are working together to be like, what do we need in our system? Like create an audit, an inventory, organize things then start to map how that would be built and architected in Drupal. Like in their documentation, they, they, they have uh, like collections, they call them, like um, paragraph bundles and like blocks. Yeah, yeah. The, it actually evolved, the whole documentation like refreshed one day while we were working on the system with a whole new like organizing system. It was the same components, but it was like nested in a different way. But they're thinking through the architecture and the technology we should also be thinking about that through the user experience lens and the flexibility of the visual side of it too. Like what can you use together that looks great, that looks optimal, that accommodates different length content. Ideally all of that's happening at the same time and then the designers and the developers go off and do their separate tasks and then, and then bring it together. That's how I would do it. Thank you. All right, well thanks everybody.